All right, so in this lecture, last lecture here of chapter 16, we'll be talking about uh, angular momentum of particles, and it's really an extension of our impulse and linear momentum discussion uh, previously. But it's going to be applied for moments and angular momentum. So impulse was force over time. Moment, this is going to be like a moment over time or a, a torque or uh, you know something of that. Uh, you know a, a rotational force, <laughs> rotation the rotational version of a force, um, and um, and then the associated angular momentum. Now uh, this is an important topic going forward. Okay, uh, when we move into rigid body dynamics, remember all we've done so far is thinking about in, uh, you know, analyzing particles or where, um, uh, you know, we ha I think of the last few examples we had, which were like uh, the package and the, the cart. And it was really like, it wasn't important that there were a shape associated with that. It was just like the object itself was one being associated with a mass and it, and it uh, you know, combined together. Um, so what's going to differentiate when we move into something more complicated, which is like real objects, is that they, they can rotate within themselves, right? So objects have a mass distribution, and they can then rotate, and they can, um, uh, you know, have more complicated dynamics because of the rotation. So our study of angular momentum is going to be vital in, in uh, moving on. Literally, the next topic is going to be uh, our introduction to rigid body dynamics, where we're going to start with rigid body kinematics, and that'll be mostly focused on this angular um, angular motion, right? So angular momentum is going to play a key role. Okay, so um, what we have here is, uh, well, let's define what we mean by angular momentum. Angular momentum. Um, and I'm going to draw a picture here in a second. So this is uh, going to be about the origin of like a coordinate system by definition okay and that's going to be the definition is the moment of linear momentum so we're taking linear momentum and how we define it and taking the moment of it taking the cross product with the distance from the origin and that's why this is going to be angular momentum about a particular point in space and that's the origin of the coordinate system all right, which sits right there. Okay, there's our point O. And let's draw a point in here. Okay, um, let's see. We have point, let's put it here-ish. Doesn't really much matter. There's our position vector. And like I said, let's give it some perspective. All right kind of gives you an idea where that point really is in three-dimensional space. We could even make it even um, more telling by completing like the box. And the key to make it really look like three-dimensional is this line is parallel to that line, which is parallel to the axis there. And once you have that, then you can just follow this one over, uh, make this one go straight up, and have this one go straight over. Okay, gives you an idea that this is kind of shooting out at us a little bit as well. <laughs> it doesn't really much matter, but I like to make these things visually nice. I mean, we're just really arbitrarily putting, you know, maybe this is the velocity of the particle right now. It could have an acceleration vector. It, it I mean, more than, you know, more than anywhere else. It, it, it doesn't really much matter. Now, um, we can, we do want to consider like an external force being applied to this particle. Okay. But the main point here is, with the definition of a, what a moment is, maybe we just draw, you know have it out here. The moment of linear momentum. Well, linear momentum is m v velocity vector, right, wherever that's pointing, and we cross that with the position vector. Okay, and that's taking the moment of linear momentum, and we'll define that as angular momentum, and we'll give it the uh, symbol just using the syntax from the book, the notation from the book h naught for angular momentum about point O. Okay, so that's here, moment of linear momentum. Okay. So, okay, as always, what, you know, what can we do with this? As always, we're going to start with um, Newton's second law. 
Can't tell you how many times that has shown up. Can't tell you how that needs to be. The main takeaway from your mechanics classes is that uh, Newton's second law is important and that we can do a lot with it. And it's even more general than this, really. Really what it says is the rate of change of momentum in time is, is equal to forces. Uh, but oftentimes we just assume mass is constant. So we throw that time derivative of momentum onto the velocity and it's just acceleration. But if mass does change or redistribute, uh, then more generally we say the time derivative of momentum is equal to the sum of the external forces. But uh, we'll leave that for another day. Okay, as always, we'll start with the Newton's second law and to get to our, you know, how this angular momentum, you know, what are the uh, kinetics of it, we'll cross it with the position vector r. Okay, so we have r cross f, or sum of the forces, equals r cross mass times acceleration. Okay, do a little bit of work on this, on the kinematic side, on the right hand side here. So let's make a note to ourselves, D D D T of, so I'm going to back our way into replacing this with this. Okay, now what I'm going to do here is start with this and convince, you know, expand this out and try to convince us that that's a fine substitution. Okay, so we're going to try to derive this starting from here. Okay. Um, that's going to be, well, first we'll do d, dr dt and then cross that result with mv. And then we'll add on, right, this is basically the chain rule. Uh, mass doesn't change, so this is dv dt. So there, that's that term. Okay, this is our acceleration vector. Okay, and, well, and then we got a velocity vector here because dr dt by definition is velocity. So we have v crossed into mv plus r crossed into ma. And this is the velocity vector crossed into itself. And any vector crossed into itself is by definition zero. Okay, it's a property of vectors. Right, the maximum amount, the maximum you can get from a cross product is when they're perpendicular to one another. Right, but whenever you try to, right, that's the same with a unit vector. If we tried to cross i with itself, that would be zero, i hat. Right, so this is zero, um, and the reason it's zero is v and mv point in the same direction because they're both velocity. Point in same direction for which the cross product is zero. And that's a trivial scenario where it's the exact same vector even. It's just the second one is scaled up by a mass. Okay, so um, treat this as a side note. We're, all of this was just so that we could replace this right hand side with this. And so now our analysis here of our kinetics has r cross f equaling the time rate of change of r crossed into mv. And uh, let's, let's label these things, right? So this is what we called the angular momentum up above, right? So this is that angular momentum about the origin. And so what the whole, what this whole side is, uh, the whole right hand side is the time rate of change of angular momentum about the origin of the coordinate system. And that's just we have to pick a point to do angular momentum about. Okay, and it's to be by definition is the origin of the coordinate system by the way we define what r is, right? r is always from the origin uh, pointing to the position. This over here, we're gonna label as M naught, or M sub O, and this is the moment about O due to this external force, F, due to external force on acting on the particle. Okay, hopefully you can read all those words. 
All right, and in that case, if those are fine definitions, then we can really simply write our principle here of angular momentum this way. And what this says, right, is exactly in our, our word usage here. It says that uh, moments on particles cause a time rate of change of, of angular momentum. So the uh, moments on particles cause uh, angular momentum to change in time. Okay, that's al already something um, interesting, a good result. But um, let's do one thing further, which is integrate this in time. So we're doing exactly like we did with the linear momentum. From now on, we just had to get to this, uh, this relationship like we did. So this is actually extremely similar, like I said, to Newton's second law. This is a, the angular or the rotational version. Make a, I want to make the statement about it this here, right? This is the rotational Newton's second law because note the traditional or linear Newton's second law in its most general form is that a force equals a time rate of change of of linear momentum which um, I don't know if we've used a symbol for that but oftentimes it uh, like like P gets used for for momentum but I'll just put MV All right that's the most general form of uh, Newton's second law and that allows the mass to change, right? But okay, the reason I'm saying this, well, what's a force when you go to rotation? Well, it's, it's really a moment. What is the, uh, you know, momentum when you go to, um, um, a, you know, rotational motion? Well, that's the angular momentum, right? Which is how we've defined h naught and m naught is the moment due to the force. Okay, time to move on. Um, we're going to integrate this relationship like we did to get the impulse uh, linear momentum relationship. We're doing something very similar. And, uh, right, so it's going to look like this, right? So we're going to integrate in time our moment, which is going to equal an integral in time of d h naught, so we're the time derivative of, so we're taking an integral of the, t a time integral of the time derivative of angular momentum, well that's just integrating a differential angular momentum from whatever angular momentum we have at time one to the angular momentum we have at time two, which, right, that's just a change in angular momentum. So here, we don't need to, add, just like we did with the conservation of linear momentum, we don't need to consider the process there, we just need to consider the state of the two, right? So if we take the the leftmost term here and the rightmost term here, that's really our identity, or the, the relationship we were looking for. This is uh, angular impulse, right? We're accumulating a moment over time, just like with a linear impulse, we accumulated a force over time. And this is change in angular momentum and the similarities to the linear momentum are just all over the place from t equals t1 to t equals t2 in time okay and so again just like with the linear momentum uh relationships we are doing two state analysis here right don't need to worry about I mean, at least on the right-hand side of this relationship. The left-hand side, yeah, we would have to integrate this in time, right? All right, so the maybe the, the big takeaway here from all of our discussion of momentum is whereas forces change linear momentum in the, in the same fashion, moments, so the moments due to those forces change angular momentum. And it, it, you know, again, the similarity between the two of them are is is a many fold. Okay, if for some, um, you know, in some scenarios, we have uh, 
no moment um no like applied moment to like a system no uh uh, uh net moment that results in a zero so this i'm sorry this could be due to so let's put some you know for example here so eg zero net force on a particle um uh, so if it feels if there's no force um the mo the moments uh, there could be you know zero net um or maybe the net force produces a zero moment all right these are all scenarios so one one way this could be is if R, er, the force is perfectly aligned with the position vector in that coordinate system um, or any coordinate system but if they're perfectly aligned um, then uh, just recall here that you'll have no moment so the moment about the origin is R cross F all right so if they're perfectly aligned two vectors that are aligned have no cross product or a zero cross product right okay so let me finish the statement if that's the case then angular momentum is conserved just like we had linear momentum conservation angular momentum conserved which means h naught two equals h naught one okay so um so that's it. Let's 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 then um, go over some examples of this, and um, we'll start here with um, more of a of a qualitative uh, example of, of this conservation of angular momentum. It's kind of the traditional example to do, which is like a, an ice skater spinning on ice, and uh, we're gonna do this with weights being held in each hand. So uh, maybe we can sneak this in the bottom here. Okay. Example of this angular momentum conservation. Spinning ice skater holding weights in each hand. And that's just to make it so that there's um, a lot of... Uh, Oops. I mean, we're just going to be describing um, this motion a little bit. This just exaggerates the, the effects a little bit, right? And then um, let's see if what happens when the skater pulls her uh, his or her arms into his or her body here, okay? Because we're talking ice, the reason we're doing this is we can we want to neglect friction. Friction neglected, uh, and also friction and air drag uh, ignored. Any other non-conservative force is not going to be what we're interested in here. Like we want to idealize the system. Okay, so let's uh, put our ice skater over here. Okay, going to exaggerate the arms quite a bit. Very long-armed. Okay, maybe even. Okay. And I don't know, I'm not going to draw any skates. <laughs> okay, now let's, uh, this ice skater is spinning about its central axis here. Okay, now this axis is actually the, you know, represents the center of mass, uh, or wherever the center of mass is. Um, that's going to be the axis about which the rotation occurs here. So we have, and we haven't really talked about center of mass yet, but, uh, should have seen this before in the statics class, right? Center of mass or physics class is the axis of rotation or tells us where that is. Okay. Uh, okay. So now let's take a, a top view of this system where we'll put that, that uh, center of mass or that uh, axis of rotation right down the middle. So we're going to look down on the ice skater and, uh, Okay, so this right here is the center of mass, and let's say there's some omega 1, and that's the scenario where the weights are way out here. Okay, so this is uh, time 1, 
how can we fit the time in here? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, let's just make this nice and big. I think we're gonna have to go into the second page, but that's okay. So this will be time one, and then beneath it we'll put what happens later on as the skater pulls those arms in. Okay, here's still that center mass, but now the weights are much closer. And what we want to do is what happens to the rotation rate, and how would we analyze this to come up with this? Okay, so let's say as the ice skater is pulling the arms in, right, there is a, well, first of all, let's put the position vectors up here in time, time one. So this is a, a later time, later time two. Well, yeah, why am I, this is like a T1. We've been so consistent to call this T1, and all of a sudden I'm just saying time two. That doesn't make any sense. Okay, so T later time T2. Okay. All right, so let's put our position vectors here, at least up in this top diagram, right? So in this diagram, there's um, the position vectors to get out to those heavy weights. Again, the weights are there, so we can kind of ignore that there's any arms there. It's just kind of the weights. Um, and due to this rotation, um, you know, there's, there's a motion of those weights. Right, the kind of, this is heading that way, this one's heading that way, okay? And then, um, the ice skater pulls those weights in. So this is the force provided by the arms on those weights, right? So the arms of the ice skater pulling in on those weights. Uh, and what we wanna do is what's the effect on the dynamical system until we get down to here, right? So uh to compare here we have a much smaller r2 right much closer r2 there and uh what happens to the velocity so i'm actually not going to even put the velocity in there yet until we can actually put an appropriate is it does the velocity get bigger or smaller and you might have some intuition there maybe you've studied this system in the past but okay let's start now analyzing it right so we have r cross f arm equals zero, right? Why is this the case? Well, since they are parallel to one another, um, they there's no cross product. The cross product is zero, right? R and F are in the same, they're aligned. I make sure they're perfectly opposite one another, but uh, they're along the same line of motion there. Uh, so the force does not produce a moment about the axis of rotation. And that's all it comes from, well, we chose the origin to be our axis of rotation for which the position vectors stem out of. And so there's no moment about that axis, about that axis, um, because that's the, you know, the, the axis of rotation, right? Okay. So now we have, uh, go to our angular momentum conservation scenario, right? We have the scenario now where there is no applied moment, wrong way, there is no applied moment, and so we have angular momentum conservation, where we can just say the uh, angular momentum in state one must equal the angular momentum in state two, right? Let's write that out, so we have sum of the moments about our origin is zero, and so h naught two must equal h naught one, which means r one crossed into m v one must equal r two crossed into m v two. There's the vector. Now v, in all of these scenarios, the radius, because we have like these, this pure um, rotational motion, your, your position vector and your velocity are perfectly perpendicular to one another. That gives you maximum cross product. In fact, you can just take the, the magnitudes and just multiply them together. All right, so what this means is that R1 V1, because the mass doesn't change, equals R2 V2, right? Mass cancels. All right, so what that means is that as 
R1 goes down as the ice skater pulls the arms in, that tangential velocity increases. So if we're going to put the uh, correct velocities, that would increase. It would depend on how much, oh, this is V2, how much uh, the ice skater pulled in the arms. Does it come all the way close to the body there? Uh, it's going to be the most rotation. That's what we see ice skaters do, right? They pull in uh, their arms when they want to pick up speed, and it's quite impressive. You know? um, we can make one more statement about this, right? Well, if the velocity is going faster here, then obviously omega must be also faster, right? Well, maybe not, right? Let's, let's check. Let's see, did the actual rotation increase? Um, remember, for this uh, circular motion, we have this nice relationship that the velocity, the tangential velocity for the circular motion, right, along the, the motion direction, it, the speed, really, is r omega, right? Where usually we say, well, you know, omega is you know, uniform for the whole system because it's like kind of all moving together here. And then the radius, you can actually think is as, as we switch it, right? Well, um, that means that if we take this relationship here and replace velocity with r omega, okay, so I'm going to sneak this underneath here, plug, plug that in. That means that r1 squared omega1 equals r2 squared omega2, okay? So now looking at this, right, the increase in omega is going to be even more drastic because it goes as the rate, as the, as the change in the, the r value squared. And so if you, you know, you pull in, maybe you, you, you uh, decrease the arm length by half, well, velocity is going to go up by a factor of two. Right? So let's say like you make the weight distance to the center of the, the axis of rotation is half as far as it used to be, then velocity will go up by two. But omega will go up by four because it goes as, the, as that radius change squared, right? So omega increases even more, even more. Okay. I knew it was a bad idea to sneak all this into the bottom of the page, uh, but I did it, right? A little bit disorganized. Let's do uh, one more example, and we'll promise here to try to do this one even uh, a little bit more um, organized. All right, so in this example, uh, this might look familiar uh, if you have started working on some problems here, but we have uh, two research satellites tethered by a cable. Uh, this is a little bit different than the one you may have seen. Um, they're initially rotating at um, uh, some some rotational speed, right? So what we mean is like in the plane as we see it, right? They're rotating this way at half a uh, revolution, well, half a rotation per minute, RPM. Uh, and initially, a over here has a mass of 100 kilograms and B is half its weight. So I represent it as like two chunks of 50 kilograms for A and one chunk of 50 kilograms for B. But then later on, half of satellite A is released, right? Maybe it was some unused part of the satellite, just maybe to get it up into orbit. Maybe it's, uh, right, just has become dysfunctional and they just wanted to release it, uh, which I don't think they do. They're very careful um, to not have a bunch of space garbage out there, or at least they try to. Um, Let's see, okay, so, uh, but half of it gets released, and it, when it's released, it has zero, ang zero angular momentum, and they can actually ensure that, or we can ensure it by just sending it straight away, so that from, like, the, uh, the origin, the origin is going to be, like, the origin choice is going to be, like, the uh, axis of rotation, somewhere here, and this one will be, like, somewhere there, as long as that then shoots away with a velocity that is parallel to the position vector, right, so r cross v will be zero, and so there'll be no angular uh, angular momentum um, due to this this object being released, right? So we've just imposed that. Oh, well, it's just said to us in the problem statement, but we just basically ignore that in terms of the angular momentum associated with that part. Okay, I think everything's there. Oh, and what we're looking for is find the angular velocity of this remaining system here. All right, so this is definitely a question of conservation of angular momentum and then we'll be able to solve for the angular uh, velocity there okay 
Let's see. So let's draw a free body diagram as always. Start there. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> no matter how big A is and how big B is, let's get a nice diagram here. So this is B, this is A. What are the forces here? Well, there could be gravity if this is where gravity is acting, right? So this is MBG, this is MAG, if this is the direction of gravity. Um, well, let's just analyze it as if it is, right? Um, and then let's put a coordinate system on here. Let's say X there, Y there. Okay. Now, the axis of rotation is going to be where the center of mass is, so let's calculate where the center of mass, right? Center of mass is at the x, where x equals c1. So it's going to be somewhere like there-ish, and I just kind of know going into this that it's going to be closer to the heavier mass for here for state 1. Um, where the form that we use is basically a weighted average of their positions, right? So c1 is going to be the x position of a times its mass so we're weighting the x position of a by its mass plus the x position of b times its mass and then divide by the sum of the the total mass of the whole system right so we're normalizing and therefore it's a weighted average well in our case this is going to be zero times that hundred kilograms um, plus 12 12 meters away to get to b from 50, right? Because we put the coordinate system right here in the center of A, that sits at an X value of 0, and B is 12 meters away. Okay? And then we divide by 100 plus 50, and we find that C1 equals 4 meters. Okay? So that means that in our first picture, this is 4 meters, and this takes up the rest, which is 8 meters, so that the total is 12 meters. Great. Okay. Now, um, when we go into the, the second scenario here, oops, just realized I was off the page, off the screen. In the second scenario, uh, equal masses, right? This is now 50 kilograms, this is now 50 kilograms. Whenever that's the case, we don't need to do any calculations. I mean, the calculations will confirm this, but C2 is going to be right in the center at 6 meters. Okay, as we have equal masses. All right. Now we um, choose the, um, okay, and now, now I put gravity on here. Here is the key, right? If we choose x equals c, whether it's c1 or c2, whatever it is, this is the center of mass as the moment center or our, you know, uh, origin or the origin. Um, then these moments due to gravity cancel by kind of the definition of what the center of mass is. This is by definition of the center of mass. Okay, so that's something to note, right? Whether gravity's playing a role, whether we're close to gravity. In fact, you know, even g might not be the appropriate value. If there's a force due to gravity here, by the center mass, it's a definition that they're going to cancel. Um, okay, so one other thing we need to do before we move in here, uh, move any further along, this w naught, right, this rotation in the initial state, I want to convert that into, you know, don't get ahead of ourselves too much. Whenever we see RPMs, always good to convert it to radians per second because that's how angular velocities that we do calculators with actually, um, you know, our, our base unit. So this 0 0.5, half a revolution or rotation per minute RPM, um, we need to do a conversion here. We got 2 pi radians in a revolution, and we have... In a minute, there are 60 seconds, right? And minutes on the top, so we can cancel it. And uh, revolutions on the bottom, so we can cancel it, right? And through that, uh, this is actually a value of 0 0.05236 rads per second. Okay, that's also a nice little setup. Uh, I just realized that was off the screen. All right, maybe you're hopefully able to take notes. Um, man, did it... Doing it more and more 
uh, as this video goes on. Okay. So, right. Maybe I'll just walk there, right? So here's the value in RPMs, revolution per minute. There's our conversion to get rid of revolutions, canceling the revolutions from the numerator there. There's two pi radians per revolution. There are 60 seconds in a minute, but we write it this way to cancel the minute there. And then in the end, write um, revs cancel revs, min cancel mins. We're left with rads per second. And then the numeric calculation is just 0.5 times 2 times pi divided by 60. And we get 0 0.05236 rads per second. Right? That's the unit we want to do our calculations in. Okay, now um, we're re ready to do impulse momentum, but we do it in an angular sense, right? Uh, and so this is a T1, T2, R cross F. There is your uh, moments, but we got none, right? There are no uh, external moments on this system. So that's, we have a conservation of angular momentum here from the initial state to the final state, right, equals zero. So that means that we can write this as like the position vector out to A crossed into the um, uh, velocity vector of A. And I'm going to put the uh, label the entire state here once we have it all down. Okay, so that is the combination, and we'll do this about C1. We'll, we'll do the notation this way, right? So we're going to write this with the C1 being our center of mass. This is all of our angular momentums for state 1, essentially, right? And we'll write the same thing over here. Now, this is going to be R of 1 half A, only that half of A that's remaining in the, in the final state, crossed into, well, a half of mass A. Uh, multiplied by the velocity of this half a, right? Just a notation with a half a there, just making sure we're we're only putting in half of it, half of it there, and then we have R B crossed into M B V B, where all of this is about the C two center of mass. We're using C two as the as the the origin of the coordinate system over here. Okay, in fact, they are the same position, right? In fact, in space, they have to be the same position. Uh, it's just maybe the system has, a, has adjusted there, right? Okay, so one thing we can definitely say is we have circular motion about the, the C's, right? No matter whether it's C1 or C2, fill in the blank there. So for all of these V's that you see, we can write them, at, we can write them as R omegas. Okay, that's kind of a, a key. Uh, thing to notice. So now we can actually plug in some some values here, right? And actually do the, the cross products. All right, so RA, that's in this first state. We need to go, let's, let's use this one here. We need to go four in the minus i hat direction, four back. And then B will be eight in the positive i hat direction. So we got minus four i hat crossed into a hundred is the weight of A. And then uh, our velocity at A is uh, r omega, okay? And uh, this is going to point in, let's write it up here. This is velocity at A, this is velocity at B, right? So A will be in the minus, um, minus J direction, as we've drawn it, right? And here is that r A, and RB. Okay, so uh, so V. This gives us the speed, right? By the way, which is the magnitude of the velocity. But we actually have to get, we have to be careful with the direction. Okay, so for this for the speed here, we're going to do R omega. That is uh, four multiplied by the initial. Omega we know to be 0 0.05236, but it's negative because it points in the negative j hat direction. Okay, plus, and now we have 8 i hat for rb crossed into, well, the weight only here, the weight here is only 50, and then we have 8 multiplied, that's the r value for rb, uh, multiplied by 0 0.05236 j hat. 
Okay, so that's just our initial angular momentum in state one, and then that must be balanced, and I definitely don't have enough room here, so I'm gonna now do the right-hand side down below, which is minus six I hat. So both of these are now gonna, basically it's gonna follow the same pattern here, but um, a few changes, right? Now the four has gone to six, because that center of mass has now changed. We're crossing this with only, now A is only weight 50, right? Half of it left. And then we have minus six, this unknown final omega pointing in the J hat direction. Well, it's really the negative J hat direction. And then we got six I hat positive there crossed into 50 times six omega F positive J hat direction. Okay, a lot going on there, right? All right, so now let's check all of these, these directions here. If we look, we've got an I crossed into a J with the double negative. Okay, I crossed into J, that's gonna be right hand this way, crossed into J, pointing upward, right? Uh, put the coordinates, let's, let's have a, another coordinate system, maybe all the way on the top with all three dimensions, I, J, and then K coming out at us. Okay, if we do I cross J, uh, sorry, I start your right hand pointing in the I direction, wrap your fingers towards J, thumb points up out of the page, that's the positive K hat direction. Okay. Okay, so let's see. And then and then we got two negatives here that are gonna cancel each other. So this value here is 83.7758. That's in the K hat direction. Let's check this other one, right? That's an I cross J. That's also K hat, right? And that's also positive there. So we'll plus 167.55. All of that is in the K hat direction. Let's check the other side. There's a negative I hat crossed into a negative J hat. That's also positive K hat. And that's 18 or er, 1,800. Okay, and we check here. Actually, that's the same exact right. Negative 650, negative six, positive 656. All right, those are the same terms. 1,800, and that's I crossed into J. So that's also a positive K hat. Oh, and we got the omega F there that we are looking to solve for. Okay, so this is an equation for omega F. We can solve for omega f by just taking uh, this summation, divide it by 3600, and we find omega f to be 0 0.06981 rad per second. And if you want to convert this back into RPMs to compare it to the initial omega naught, let's do that. All right? There is there I, I, there is definitely some easier intuition with RPMs. You can see how many revolutions is this? How many rotations is this actually doing? in a minute, um, I think that's easier quantity to, uh, you know, wrap your head around. Ooh, another pun there. Okay, um, so here the, the, the conversion is, let's get rid of the seconds, so 60 seconds per minute, one revolution, two pi rads. Now we do that calculation, we get 0 0.66, so it's exactly two thirds RPM. And whether you answer this in rads per second or RPMs, that is completely fine. Revolutions per minute. Okay. Now, what? Let, let's interpret this result for just a minute here. Our initial, we were at half an RPM, and now we're up to two thirds RPM. That's a higher uh, rotation rate. So what actually happened here? And as we move forward in the class, we'll, we'll dig into this more. What's actually happening here is with the loss of mass, right? Having the mass fly off here, we've actually lowered our moment of inertia, right? And when, the lower, when we have a lower moment of inertia, there's less resistance to rotational motion, right? Because the moment of inertia is a rotational motion quantity here. And so therefore, for the same energy in the system, it's going to rotate faster, right? So that's a um, more advanced way to think about this, but uh, something that definitely belongs in the scope of this class. Okay, so that's it for our examples here um, um, with our angular momentum.